Great. Excellent. Thanks. Okay, so we have the, the first remote um, talk uh, by Nuria Gonzalez, who is an associate professor at NC State. Nuria was also an associate professor um, in Spain, University of Vigo, and uh, a senior researcher, uh, research scientist at the University of Texas uh, at Austin. She's an editor for the IPPOLI transactions on wireless communications and an elected member of the IPPOLI sensor array and multi-channel te and technical committee. Her research interests include signal processing theory, signal processing and machine learning, uh, massive MIMO, and of course also vehicle to everything uh, communications, positioning and joint sensing and communication. So I will leave the floor to Noria. Okay with you, Noria. Thank you, thank you, Anna. For thank you. Thank you. So uh, I will try to give a, a supplementary perspective to what Heng was proposing, and I completely agree with him regarding these uh, acronyms we are all using uh, rela related to how to describe the interaction between sensing and communication in current and future wireless network. And, and I also like this idea of integrating sensing and communication. There are many types of um, possible collaborations between these two uh, different uh, goals. And I will try to cover that in this uh, talk. Uh, this is work that I've been doing with other people in my team, my former student, Anuna Lee. Uh, and other people that are currently working in Atensi State too, Jun, Joan, Murat, and they have been part of all the work I'm going to describe today. And it's also in the context of the 6G NC Research Center. We have started, I'm co-directing co this center with Professor Robert Heath. And we are having a lot of industry support, in particular for the topics I'm going to describe today. We have support from Toyota, from Nokia, and from Samsung. And it's really interesting to collaborate uh, with them and see their perspectives, what they consider interesting, how they introduce, help us to introduce interesting challenges. And, and, and it's, it's a really interesting interaction. So uh, following what Han said also is that this, this uh, goal era, era of, communicate, of uh, localization and that's part of this integrated sensing and communication initiative that uh, is having many different uh, waves of, of appear uh, in different uh, contexts. Uh, IEEE through different societies is launching many initiatives, also many special sessions in conferences, many uh, webinars, uh, industry initiatives in uh, cellular industry and also in Wi-Fi. Uh, there is a working group only on uh, wireless land sensing, uh, 11BF, the context of the IEEE working work groups in Wi-Fi. And the same happens with uh, the, the alliances that are being developed to uh, target the new requirements for 6G and the new technologies that will make it possible. So a lot of excitement there and many, many things are happening. Uh, my vision of this uh, technology for vehicular networks is particularly interesting because we are integrating many different ways of sensing and communication. We can integrate sensing at the base station with conventional sensors, and we can use those sensors to help communication or to get data interesting for other users. Uh, we are also integrating the sensors at the vehicles. Vehicles are especially interesting in the sense of being devices that already have many integrated sensors that can also provide uh, a lot of interesting information for communication. And finally, the vision that Henk was also uh, explaining in his talk is related to how to use the communication signal for sensing. So you can see all these inter interactions and why integration is the most interesting, more appropriate word, I would say. And the idea is looking at all this uh, whole thing of uh, sensors in the devices, in the access points, the ability of the communication waveform to sense things, 
is, is the idea is to enable many different applications, use cases. And uh, there are two different ways we can do this. We can think of ways of using that communication signal for sensing and enable those corresponding sensing use cases, uh, simultaneous localization and mapping, gesture and activity recognition, tracking of devices. But another perspective is how to use sensing information to aid communication, to enable communication. For example, one problem at millimeter wave is the overhead of establishing the link that being trained in a stage where we have to learn the channel to be able to be able to configure the uh, antenna arrays at the transmitter and the receiver. And that takes a lot of training. And if we can use sensors to reduce our training overhead, we are enabling this idea of a communication aided by sensing. Regarding the interaction between communication and sensing for sensing purposes, I see two different uh, ways to do it. One is joint localization and communication, where I call it like that. It's, it means really direct localization. When you use directly the downlink signal or the uplink signal with connected objects to provide uh, inf information about the position as a byproduct of communication. But there is another mode of operation to obtain sensing information, which is during radar and communication. That means that the transmitter sends uh, the waveform, the communication waveform, and listens to the echoes that are coming from the non-connected objects. And this requires a full duplex operation, even if it's, if it's not needed for communication, it will be needed for uh, sensing because we are operating like a radar, listening to the echoes, uh, non-connected objects, uh, can also be sensed, but that that means that the, the receiver needs to be able to cancel the interference created by the transmitter. So it's, it's really full duplex, uh, a full duplex of problem. So in my perspective, in my group, we have been working on these ideas of sensor-aided communication, joint localization communication, and joint radar communication. There are three people in my team who are especially connected to these areas, John, June, and Murat. And in the next uh, uh, minutes, I will try to explain the main things we have been doing in the last year, last two years, probably in some cases, some of the projects are longer. And I hope you find it interesting and supplementary to what Heng was also uh, explaining. I will start with the idea of radar-aided communication. This is some work that I started when I was in Spain, uh, the University of Vigo, and that in the last two years have been funded by Toyota and Nokia. And what we are trying to do here mainly is to reduce the, uh, the overhead of establishing the communication link, the overhead of the initial access when uh, we are trying to, to create this millimeter wave uh, link. If we look at the 5G new radio standard, we look at the values uh, of the parameters they use to uh, create these uh, beams that are being sent by the uh, base station periodically. Uh, and if we look at the different system parameters uh, related to the antenna size that can be used, something very, very, conventional, it could be 64 antennas at the base station, 16 at the device. And we look at the number of synchronization blocks that we need to send and how often we send those blocks. And just for those numbers, for example, you will get more than 300 seconds for initial access just to establish the link. In, three millis in 300 milliseconds, the vehicular link, uh, the, the vehicular channel will have changed. So uh, it's really a lot of overhead and we need to find ways to uh, do it much faster. Uh, one uh, option that we explore in, in some recent papers is using sensors to provide information about the communication channel. And this can be different sensors, can be radar, can be LIDAR, and uh, could also be other communication systems that are operating in parallel. So the idea is just to try to find uh, 
any sources information about our millimeter wave communication channel without taxing uh, those communication resources like that. And uh, one strategy that we explore is to use is, is using radar. Uh, we can use the radar as an active sensor at the base station, or we can use a radar receiver at the base station, which is listening to the radar, uh, automotive radar that is in most of the cars. Uh, in, in both cases, what we are trying to do is to find the relationship between the radar channel and the communication channel. It can be not, not perfect uh, and complete channel information, can be only the covariance, for example. For example, the, um, this car can be uh, trying to listen to the uh, radar waveform that is being sent by the base station, just to try to estimate the covariance of the radar channel. Um, from that radar channel covariance, try to infer information about the communication uh, channel covariance. And in the other uh, way, uh, in the passive mode, what we can do is to put a, a radar receiver and listen to this uh, automotive radar signal. And also we can try to obtain the covariance information. Um, we did some initial uh, design and ray tracing experiments and, and also field measurements. And we really could uh, verify that there is this similarity between the radar and communication channels. And uh, well, after that, we started to work on more uh, complex approaches to exploit this idea. And one of these approaches is this passive radar at the roadside unit that was I was describing. And um, the good part, the, the, to me, the most interesting part here is that this works in no line of sight situation. So it's not just using uh, the radar in a, in a line of sight uh, situation where we don't have so many troubles to uh, estimate the channel uh, and establish the link, but also works very well and verified by ray tracing and part in a prototype that it can work with no line of sight channels. And uh, we just need to include at the base station this passive array, which is listening. For example, here you can see it's going to be listening to these rays that model the radar uh, signal that is going out from these uh, automotive radar models in the car. And obviously, there will be a similarity with the blue rays that correspond to the communication model that I'm assuming in this figure that is located on the uh, roof of the car. And the idea is to exploit that similarity. Um, if we just receive the automotive radar signal at that base station and we try to obtain uh, the covariance of the radar channel, we have some challenges. The first thing is that we do not know the waveform, the radar waveform that the car is being used. The, the base station doesn't know that. So it's not possible to do the usual radar processing where you mix with the um, a radar waveform to obtain a given uh, chill rate that is giving you information about the range or uh, to, to process also the phase and, and obtain the information about Doppler and speed. So we cannot do that, but we can mix with a, a different uh, waveform. In particular, we can mix with a waveform which is si simply a sinusoid with a given frequency, which is not obviously uh, exactly the initial frequency that I use in the car, because I don't know it. Um, from there, I cannot obtain any range estimation, any phase estimation. My goal is to obtain the covariance, because that's what I'm going to use to design the precoder at the base station to communicate with that vehicle. And what we prove in that paper is that, because there is no time dependence in the covariance, it only depends on the phase difference across the different antennas in that uh, radar array at the base station, we can obtain exactly the spatial covariance. As if we knew the, the, the radar waveform being transmitted by the car. Uh, we had to overcome some challenges related to the 
bias of the estimation and extrapolation of the points of the covariance. But finally, we got uh, an interesting, uh, I think interesting uh, method to obtain covariance information for the communication channel just from the automotive radar signal. And we tested that idea and that design in a ray tracing scenario. This is something I want to propose. I see many limitations in, in many of the works on integrating sensing and communication. There are too many synthetic channels, too many synthetic situations which do, which do not reflect clearly uh, the reality at all. Uh, I completely agree with Hank about all these hardware limitations, calibrations, uh, dealing with real channels, uh, no line of sight components which are weak. All these issues are important and having a simulation tool that uh, helps you to be closer to reality is important. And here we were using ray tracing. Uh, we were creating a vehicular environment following the 3GPP recommended method methodology. They have a document where they will tell you, for example, how many lanes you should include in your simulation of a vehicular system, the current track ratio, the intervehicle distance for different traffic situations, the speeds. So we were trying to be as realistic as possible. Um, we also uh, try to consider realistic locations of the radars in, in, in cars. And well, there is not any standardization for that. So we just follow in our ray tracing model, we just follow one of the uh, vehicles in the market, in particular, this OD8. So I think we were able to deploy this, of course, synthetic scenario, but, but much closer to reality than in other cases. And we were testing the, the results. And well, I, I put there the final result is that we got a 77% uh, improvement in, in the overhead uh, when using this strategy of just listening to the automotive radar in the car. Of course, there are still mismatches between the communication channel and the radar channel because of different reasons. If you look at the system model that I'm proposing, obviously the location of the radio module and the location of the radar module are, are different, are slightly different. Also the frequencies can be slightly different. Well, not that slightly, less. they don't have to be exactly the same, even if they both operate at millimeter wave. Uh, also the geometry of the, of the arrays can be different. So there are mismatches. And those mismatches are different are very difficult to model. I think this is one of those cases where that Hank was mentioning in his talk when discussing the role of machine learning, artificial intelligence, where the model cannot do much because it's very, really very difficult to introduce into a mathematical model all these uh, sources of mismatch between the radar and communication channel and later being able to mathematically reach a solution. So. What we did is to uh, try to refine our information about the communication channel obtained from the radar channel using a, a deep network. And we try different strategies. We, for example, consider the azimuth power spectrum obtained by the radar uh, array. And we try to translate that radar spectrum, azimuth spectrum, to communication as in the power spectrum. Uh, we also try to map or translate uh, the main eigenvectors of the radar covariance matrix to the communication, to the eigenvectors of the uh, communication covariance. And well, among the three strategies, this one of uh, translating the eigenvectors was the most interesting. And um, employing machine learning here to refine our estimate of the covariance or eigenvectors of the covariance uh, provide a, a, an additional increase in, in, in the performance of 21%. So really this, this is interesting, this combination of understanding very well the problem mathematically, going mathematically as far as we can, and then introducing machine learning when we cannot do anything else from an algorithmic and mathematical perspective. Uh, we have been working on extending this to a multi-user scenario where we are able to separate the automotive radar signals coming from the different vehicles. 
that has been already tested and verified in, in ray tracing. We also have some work leveraging other sensors like LiDAR. We are also working on how to transfer that information that we obtain uh, with that, that uh, ability that is relying in machine learning, how we can use transfer learning to uh, optimize with very few new training the, the networks in different sites. So we optimize in one site and how can we uh, optimize in, in a different site without having to retrain again from scratch. And then we are also trying to go uh, farther and estimating the radar, the, the channel completely uh, using the, the radar signal. Well, it is really impossible to estimate a communication channel all the parameters from the radar channel because there are parameters like faces which are not going to be related. So we may need some additional training, but very few training frames, just because we have a lot of information about the channel already. And these are the ideas we have been working on related to radar-aided communication. I will start now with a different perspective on how sensing and communication can interact that is more related to the previous talk is how to use the millimeter wave signal for your localization and communication. Um, the idea I'm going to explore here is using the downlink of the uplink signal. So I, we have to assume that we want to localize a connected object. So in our case, uh, we are interested in vehicles. Uh, we have to assume that the vehicles are connected. And in 60, uh, the, the companies uh, that are interacting in different alliances and organizations, they are talking about uh, accuracies in the order of 10 centimeters, which is really, really hard in an outdoor uh, vehicular em environment with all the practical uh, conditions of, of the real scenario, the real hardware. Um, there are many, many different uh, types of measurements that we can take to, to from the millimeter wave signal to obtain the position information. And depending on what we can measure, uh, we can we may need more or one one or more uh, base stations to obtain the position information. It's clear, for example, that if we are able to obtain time different of arrival and angular information, we can do the localization with just uh, one a base station. But if we don't have angular plus delay information, then we are going to need more, uh, more uh, the, the collaboration of more access points with more base stations to uh, localize. There are many methods. We have different types of measurements, and there are many ways also of exploiting the information in those measurements. Uh, in the context of, of 6G and vehicular communication, uh, there are methods that exploit the beam training protocol in 5G. Um, mainly these methods rely on several base stations measurements performed with several base stations and require synchronization of the base stations, which is really difficult. Uh, then there are other methods that uh, exploit machine learning. The errors are usually very high, even in very synthetic scenarios. And then there are many papers, uh, in the many recent papers, on the idea, exploiting the idea of estimating the millimeter wave channel using a compressive approach and then mapping those channel parameters to the position of the device. Um, I could give a long list of papers. Here, I just chose uh, three representing all these three approaches that I'm mentioning here. But in general, in most of the papers, we have limited evaluation scenarios. We do not have too much ray tracing there. There are also many unrealistic assumptions, for example, those related to synchronization or the model for the channel or the synthetic channels that are use, being used to test the algorithms. Uh, the settings are very simple. Uh, many, many assumptions, for example, related to, to synchronization, as I said, and perfect calibration, perfect synchronization. So it seems in those papers that we are able to achieve very good uh, performance in localization, but 
if we move to reality, if we move to ray tracing, uh, even without adding all the hardware impairments that Hank was mentioning, we are in the order of meters. We are not having all those uh, nice uh, measurements. And I want to discuss one of these uh, issues and just to, 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 to share with you the type of task that we have. So you can see how difficult it is. I show here a, one of these vehicular channels that we generated with ray tracing. You can see here, we have the base station in this uh, street. There are a bunch of trucks, cars, and there is a, a receiver here in this, in this uh, car. And what you see on the right is the channel parameters that we are measuring by retracing. And you can see the huge difference in gain between the line of sight and no line of sight components. So it's very interesting for localization and is one of the interesting things of operating at millimeter wave is that we can exploit the no line of sight paths. But you can see that the, the gain is very different. So it's very difficult to estimate well those no line of sight uh, paths. Um, and uh, if we try to, to see how the channel estimation strategies that exploit the sparsity of the millimeter wave channel perform, we are gonna see some of the issues that we did not see for, for communications. So first, let's, let's see what we are doing. We are trying to relate the parameters of the channel, which are angles and, and uh, delays to the uh, position, the relative position between the vehicle and the base station. And we assume that we know, of course, the, the absolute position of the base station. And in that case, the, the position that we can obtain for the vehicle is also absolute. We have a channel model where we have all these uh, angles and delays angles and delays, and we have a pulse shaping full function that is modeling the filtering effects of the transmitter and the receiver. So let's assume that we estimate a channel uh, exploiting the sparsity, and then we transform geometrically with some equations. We can see the geometry here. This is very well explained in one of the first papers on millimeter wave localization that uh, Hank and his team were publishing a few years ago. And well, that, that those geometric relationships are very clear, but we need to have a very good estimation of the channel. One of the issues that we have is that in some of these papers, uh, it is assumed that the, there's a perfect synchronization between the vehicle and the base station at the level of that we know when the transmission started at the receiver, and that's very unrealistic. We really need to have a delay that models uh, the difference between the beginning of the transmission and the beginning of the reception is, is this offset that I have there on the right part of the slide. And then we have the delays for the different parts. And the channel estimation algorithm, what is providing is the relative delays corresponding to the different parts. Um, if we are able to leverage the angular information and this a relative delays, time difference of arrival, or first order reflections, then uh, we can be more realistic. For example, we can exploit this type of geometric relationships. In these geometric relationships, we are not exploiting directly that we know the time of arrival, the absolute time of arrival uh, of the line of sight component, for example, because we don't know the offset. So, we, we consider the offset, the offset as an additional parameter that we introduce in our, in our problem. And we can exploit, for example, the, the geometric relationship in this simple triangle where I have one line of sight path and I have a first order reflection. And I can create this type of connection between the distance between the base station and the vehicle this, this distance D is exploiting the relative delays, as you can see here, and also the angular information. So if we do that, we are gonna be more realistic. Uh, we can build the least scores estimators when we have several pairs of 
line of sight and low line of sight components. And we can also be exploiting similar uh, geometry uh, an estimator only that, that works if we only have no line of sight paths. That, that is, is always possible. But the main problem is to is being able to really estimate well those angular parameters and those relative delays. Let's see an example of that. The challenge estimation accuracy that we require for localization is, 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 is way, way harder than the one that we need for communication. For communication, we basically need to steer the beams approximately in the, in the right directions, but the, the beams are not so narrow for communication that uh, 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 so, some drift is going to cause a huge problem. So even if we have estimations of the channel that for some parts are not that good, it's not that important. In addition, um, for communication, only the most uh, st stronger uh, parts are going to matter. It doesn't matter what happens with the weaker parts. But here for localization, we are going to need these no line of sight weak paths to if we want to really get a very uh, high accuracy. Do you see this example here? On the right, you have the, uh, the representation of the angular uh, angle of arrival and angle of departure corresponding to different channel paths. So I have one path here that um, is, is an inside that red square, which is the line of sight path, is very strong. You can see it here is, is yellow. There is also no line of sight paths also there, but there is a strong one here. And then these are all the other combinations of angle of departure and arrival or other no line of sight paths. And you can see that the challenge estimation algorithm that we were proposing before for communication, even if it achieves for the simulation parameters we use, a very low a mean square error with 80 training frames is only to is only able to estimate with good accuracy the angle of arrival and angle of departure of that main path. All these other paths that, that are here represented are not uh, estimated that well. Maybe this one, this second one is also not bad estimation, but in general, we don't have like six, 10, no line of fat, no line of sight paths that are well estimated. So the conclusion here, when you, you see many channel realizations, I mean, you see uh, many uh, simulations with different system parameters, is that localization requires much higher channel estimation accuracy than communication. And we need other metrics to measure how well we are estimating the channel because the normalized mean square error doesn't say anything at all. It can be low, but even in that case, you, you may not be able to do very good localization. Another problem that we have when we are trying to do a sparse channel estimation for localization is the complexity and memory requirements that we may need. If we look at previous approaches, this is in one of my papers. It's not about criticizing other colleagues. It's like trying to uh, overcome the limitations of prior work. So we were just doing channel estimation for communication. We were collecting the measurements of the received signal from a given number of training frames in this uh, vector y. We have a sensing matrix that basically obtain the received signal with different combinations of training precoders, training combiners, the pilot. And then we represent the, spark, the millimeter wave channel the vectorized millimeter wave channel we will present it as a sparse signal that can be written in terms of a sparsifying dictionary and the vectorized channel coefficients. And when we reconstruct the channel, what we want to do is to estimate this, uh, this vector that I have there. And the problem that I have if I use the previous approaches for localization is that the, 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 the requirements of the sizes of these matrices, they is go uh, very, very high and are not feasible. For example, if we look at the expressions of the sparsifying dictionary and sensing metrics, when we use reasonable values for the length of the pilot, for the number of training frames, for the number of received antennas, we can see very, very easily that we th this is going to go very, 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 very big. It's going to be impossible to then simulate this 
because of the memory. And also, in terms of the computational complexity, applying a sparse recovery with dictionaries that are built from chronic product of uh, steam vectors evaluated on a grid of angles of arrival, angles of departure here, and also uh, a dictionary for the delays, which is uh, built from sampling this, this uh, equivalent uh, filtering uh, function with the resolution needed in the delay domain. This is going to go also very big and create a lot of uh, complexity problems just because of the way we have been uh, formulating in general with different variations, but at the end, everyone is using this chronic air structure of uh, steam vectors evaluated on a grid in, in many, many papers. So what we are proposing to solve that is to solve an, an alternative problem uh, where we write our uh, channel and our receipt signal in terms of a product of sparsifying dictionaries. Instead of trying to build whole dictionary from chronic products with all the dimensions, the angles of departure, arrival, uh, and, and delays, what we do in our work that we just submitted is to try to solve, instead of the previous problem in the previous slide, and instead of using the previous dictionary, we try to use uh, projections over a product of dictionaries. And those dictionaries are much smaller. Those dictionaries are independent because they reflect uh, things that are independent in nature, like the dictionaries for the azimuth or the dictionaries for elevation or the dictionary for, uh, for the delays. And in particular, for example, if we consider a planar arrays, this is gonna go even bigger because I have two dimensions. If I use this approach and I want to do 3D localization with planar arrays, I just have more dictionaries in this product, one that reflects what happens in X axis, the other one reflects what happens in the Y axis, but it's a still a product. So I can operate with planar arrays. I can operate with the realistic parameters in terms of number of antennas and, and, and the resolution that I need to estimate well the angles and the delays in the, in the channel. Um, another problem that we have is that many times when we establish this geometric relationship between the channel parameters and the position, we are assuming that the paths are first or the reflections or the line of sight paths. And, and when we have the channel estimate from the communication model, we do not know very well if those are first uh, or the reflections or not. Is is and also it's a difficult problem uh, if we want to treat it from a, a mathematical perspective. We can try to exploit some relationships in the paths to see if they come from walls or a floor or the ground and see if they are first order because some some um, relationships have to be fulfilled. But still, it's a difficult problem. So we have been working on designing a machine learning network that uh, classifies the paths that are estimated by the compressive channel estimation model. In that way, we can select the line of sight, the first order reflections, and use those to create the corresponding geometric transformation between channel parameters and, and um, position information. And I think this, this help us to increase our accuracy because if we just have one path, which is not well classified, that's going to have a really bad impact in the error because we are not applying a geometric transformation that is correct. There are many other challenges that uh, need to be addressed to achieve these requirements of accurate localization. Uh, I also see these two uh, that I uh, included here as really promising risk aided localization that Rehenk also mentioned is, is very interesting, but the initial work is scarce. It still considers many critical assumptions there, like again, perfect synchronization, uh, high resolution architectures, let's say not, not realistic hardware many times. And then another research direction that I think is very interesting to achieve higher accuracy is fusing sensor and communication data uh, for for 
increasing the robustness of the estimation and the accuracy of the estimation. Finally, just a couple of slides about the other approach to integrating science signal communication, which is using that uh, communication signal as a radar. So we will be listening to the uh, echoes of our transmitted signal. That means that we need to be able to cancel the self-interference between the transmitter and the receiver. There are many things we can do. We can optimize the frame structure in that communication signal. We can optimize the waveform. We can optimize the precoders and combiners. But a key difference with other work in, in millimeter wave communication is that we need to account for the self-interference. And this is a collaboration with a Professor Baikama's group. I thought I should mention, I think it's interesting. I think it's the first work where we try to do joint radar and communication accounting for the self-interference. And we try to address the problem of localizing a given target while we are communicating. So this is not initialized. It's not like the other work I was mentioning on joint localization and communication where I'm estimating the channel to establish the link. Here, I assume the link is established. There is communication with several users. And I need to also obtain the, uh, the, the position, for example, of a target which is not connected. And using a full duplex operation mode, I'm going to try to optimize the informing so I can serve both purposes, communication and sensing. And the way we do it, I skip the questions to make it easier to follow, is that what we're going to do is to try to maximize the gain in the direction of sensing. So as again, we assume there was an initial access phase where that target was roughly identified. So we know more or less, not with too much accuracy, where the target is. And now in this tracking phase, we want to uh, localize accurately that target. So our metric is maximizing the gain in the direction of sensing, but we have constraints because we need to keep some gain at the user directions. Uh, we need to keep that gain higher than a, a given threshold to guarantee that our communication does not suffer too much because of the sensing. And we also need to consider that if this is a multi-user scenario in general, so we need to cancel inter-user interference. And at the receiver side, when we are listening to the echoes, we need to maximize the gain with the combiner in the direction of sensing, but we also need to cancel the self-interference created by the transmitter. And what we are doing now is uh, to attack the other phase, the initial access phase. And in my group with Mulat and uh, other people in my team, we are trying to look at the problem of how to design this uh, precoder, this combiner to uh, accurately estimate the location of the user and at the same time cancel surf interference, but during initial access. And um, well, I think. Uh, there are many other problems in general related to accounting for hardware, accounting for operating at higher frequencies, higher than the 60 gigas or 70 gigas. And well, I hope you find uh, all this interesting and uh, you can join us in trying to make this work because it's a really hard problem to, to, to enable all these sensing opportunities with the accuracy that is required by many of the use cases. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nuria. Thank you. Questions from the audience here in the room? Yeah, there are two questions. Should I go there? Or? Um, yeah, probably better to let Nuria hear you. So, Nuria, we have uh, a question uh, from Hank. And then one from Sua. So Hank is first. <coughs> Hi, Noria. Thank you for the nice presentation. I look forward to reading some of the papers you mentioned. It looks really interesting, this multidimensional orthogonal pursuit. My, my question is, do you see any potential for these intelligent surfaces for radar applications? I, I have a hard time to un understand how they could be used given the extreme path loss that you would have. Yeah, I don't see it. <laughs> Okay, then I think, then I think we are <laughs> No, I don't see it. I think it can be interesting to generate 
So I think it's a different perspective from using it for communication. For communication, people is thinking, okay, yeah, I'm gonna use it when I don't have line of sight, but I think for positioning, we can use it also to have an alternative path, which is also strong. Yes. But if we do, if we have to add the reflections for the radar operation, I think it's going to be much worse because in this paper we are uh, finishing and we already submitted a version to Spock. We see the problem of the attenuation, and you will need a really huge surface to 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 be able to do something in in a radar mode i don't see it okay then i think we are live thank you thank you very much so we'll have a, a second question from francois who is reaching the laptop now uh, hi nuria thanks for the nice lecture uh, <clears throat> i have a question on the i, I was very interested in this uh, identification of the uh, path in the millimeter wave and uh, and their delays and things like that. That's uh, that's quite interesting. I was wondering. So assume you have a very um, a, a very scattering framework and a medium which is which has lots of reflectors. Uh, um, so my question is whether the method that you develop could detect that before, um, or uh, whether you have to know that the medium has a certain number of paths. In order to, to apply the method. So the question is whether you can detect that from the method or whether you have to know. Yeah, no, you do not have to know. Okay. So we we play with one advantage. There are gonna be more parts in the channel than the ones we can really use for communication or for localization, because some of them are gonna be too weak. We do not care about them. Uh -huh. So when we use these compressed channel estimation strategies we can just fix the maximum number of parts for example or we can say we can know the we can estimate the noise power and say i don't want to keep estimating uh if, if my variance in the estimation is higher than the noise power so we have a strategies to stop but i think we don't even need them we just need to know i'm not going to use more than six parts five parts this is the other ones are going to be too weak I see. so in my experience in practice, that's not the issue. The issue is to being able to accurately estimate those weaker parts. That's mm -hmm. a huge issue. And I see it in indoor channels, vehicular channels, everywhere. Mm -hmm. I see. But assume you would be in this framework, say, of uh, a relay phase with lots, lots of sort of uh, equivalent powers for me. Uh, then, then are, yeah. If you are in that situation, that yeah. is more like in lower frequencies not yeah. really that much millimeter wave i don't think the line of the no line of sight paths are helpful are more an issue than than uh, something helpful so it's more difficult to do the okay localization there hank knows about this much more than me uh i have less experience on working outside the, the millimeter wave band or receptor mm here -hmm. But I think it's, it's harmful more than helpful in general. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Basically, because you cannot relay that much those parts to the physical environment, too. Yeah. This reflection in this scatter, you don't know. It's just random. So which is geometric transformation are you going to exploit? You, you don't have it. Mm -hmm. so it's right. difficult. Okay, so it's really meant for millimeter wave with some uh, clear understanding of the uh, of the. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Because the air is more sparse, everything. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you very much, Nuria. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So we now have a, a coffee.